Chapter 3, Never Less Alone Than When Alone After entering my apartments and locking myself in I had the impression of not being alone, which caused me to remain near the door I had entered, wondering if anyone was concealed within. This was not a pleasant contemplation to one, who had never quite outgrown that indefinable awe of the darkness, which night brings and fastens upon our childhood. At first I did not consider this sensation as embracing a being of the invisible, but after a moment's reflection, that it did was testified to, by a voice saying calmly, I am here. While I half expected to hear the voice, it startled me and I cannot say I was entirely pleased, to have this mysterious presence alone with me at night with no living thing near. It was well enough during the day in the presence of others, but now to be locked in alone with it in the still watches of the night, was something quite different, a difference one would have to experience to appreciate. After deliberating a moment, I moved cautiously into the middle of the room, where I stood trembling in a coldness so intense it was like standing in a refrigerator, this, too, in the latter part of May, after rather a warm day. Still combating the impulse to run headlong out of the room, I stood transfixed, looking about in an agony of odd suspense, cringing from I knew not what, some indefinable something that I knew was there somewhere, something against which I had no means of defending myself. I do not know how long I stood there before the realization came upon me that I must do something to break the thrall which held me, that I could not stand there all night experiencing an awe that paralyzed with every pulse beat. Their fears are most who know not what they fear. Almost mechanically, I began slowly pulling off my gloves, and, fastening them together, tossed them on a nearby chair. I then removed my hat, stepped nearer to the chair and placed it with something of precision upon the gloves. One of the hat pins fell and rolled to the floor with a noise that in the dense stillness sounded like a bomb explosion, and startled me most distressingly. With a sudden impulse of daring, I passed hurriedly out of the room into the dressing room beyond, where I stopped short, dismayed in the semi-darkness by the sensation of many eyes upon me. I sank into a chair, almost overcome by the many-sided mystery that pressed in upon me on every side, and, Summoning the fragment of remaining courage, I looked about the room and was astounded at the apparitions, ghosts, spirits, or what you will, there they were in all stages of materialization, with white clouds playing amongst them, in which floated white, transparent hands, and glimpses of faces and forms dimly discernible, and eyes, such eyes. I could hear soft footfalls, on the floor, as they moved about, and knocks coming from everywhere, could feel touches and hear whispers, voices calling my name in a pleading way. A cold breeze was stirring about the room and a numbness was upon me as I closed my eyes to shut out the sight. But a sense of drowsiness warned against possible unconsciousness, which spurred me into action. It was with considerable effort that I dragged myself out of the chair and walked, weak and trembling, into the bedroom and stood beside the south window where the gulf breezes exercised a reviving effect. As I looked out on the calm beauty of the night, I gradually shook off the awesome condition that enthralled me and could have laughed at myself for what seemed foolish fears and fancies, and was ashamed of having indulged such demoralizing propensities as I admitted myself guilty of. In an effort to shake it off entirely, I repeated to myself a number of times, I am alone in this room, even trying to exclude and thought the one presence I knew to be there somewhere. To further this self-deception, I fixed my thoughts upon the events of the day, the pleasures thereof, crediting to fancy the visitor of mystery, and gradually filling my mind with thoughts of my beloved to the exclusion of all things else. When I felt myself master of the situation, I walked with proud unconcern into the dressing room and began preparations for retirement, my thoughts filled with something more tangible than ghosts and such things, which I kept consciously shut out of my mentality. I had a most distressing time unhooking the close-ranged hooks and eyes on my dress that fastened up the back, and as I labored with it I could feel hands touching mine, as though assisting in the operation, yet I stubbornly ignored that which, I knew would demoralize if recognized, and proceeded as placidly as such an enforced attitude would permit. No sooner were my shoulders bared than an open hand, humanly warm, pressed upon one shoulder and passed perceptibly across the back to the other. In a paroxysm of fear, I drew my waist hastily up over my shoulders and sat down utterly overcome. Such an unpardonable liberty for even a ghost to take and the fact that he had the daring and the ability to execute it, was sufficient to frighten one less timid than myself. Again came the oppressive sense of many eyes upon me, making me ashamed of being partly undressed and I began forthwith repairing the cause of my embarrassment, with the determination of leaving the house and spending the remainder of the night at a hotel feeling it impossible to remain all night, 
alone, with that spectral horde, beings to whom locks and keys were as nothing. I could not restrain the tears as I made preparations for this unexplainable exit from the house in the dead hours of night, but proceeded with unwavering resolution until a hand came upon my arm and I heard a reproachful voice saying, Fanny, don't you know we will not harm you? Unfortunately, I do not know it, I responded, somewhat bitterly. Aren't you ashamed of such cowardice? But why have so many come? I persisted. Attracted by your ability to recognize and communicate with them. They are rejoicing and are here to welcome you. Do not wound them by being afraid. I am not afraid now, I replied, feeling something like a return of equilibrium, if not of entire assurance. Encouraged by my attitude of neutrality they renewed their advances, perceptibly increasing in numbers as the room increased in chilliness. Pleading voices came, listen to me, please, some gave names, others were trying to tell of incidents, names, dates, days of the week, of the year and of the month indiscriminately. It was useless to try to discriminate, therefore, I listened in a general way, while all manner of demonstrations were being made, until overcome by the perplexing strain I gave way to tears. After indulging somewhat copiously, I lifted my head and looked about, to find the room entirely empty, and, as inconsistent as it may seem, I felt aggrieved for having wounded beings, no matter what they were, who had come to me with the offering of their companionship. A voice came in upon my contrition soothingly. Do not worry child, most of them have had existence on earth. They understand, but since coming here they have been unable to communicate with earth beings although having the ability to do so. If they would only come one at the time, I complained. It would be better so but as there are so few with whom they can intelligently communicate, when one is found, it is an event of general rejoicing. Evidently, I made answer thoughtfully, feeling sorry for having disappointed them. The voice interrupted further regret by saying firmly. Now undress and go to bed. Very well, I assented, and with feverish haste began, still struggling with the embarrassment of undressing before an audience and put on my nightclothes with more celerity than ever before in my memory. All the time, half resenting the tone of authority the voice assumed. This accomplished, I hurried into the bedroom to be confronted by a real dilemma, that of putting out the light and facing the ghosts in the darkness. This does not sound nearly so formidable as it really was. It was a combination entirely too much for unmoved contemplation. As I stood looking at the light in the fullness of its fancied protection, I heard the clock striking and counted every stroke. It was twelve o'clock. No. There was no need of debating on the subject any further. To be locked in with the ghosts was bad enough in the light but in the darkness, it was impossible, a thing not to be thought of. I remembered that I had a little night lamp, which solved the problem, despite the faintness of its illumination. And a few minutes later I was examining it and congratulating myself that it was in first-class working order. As I tested the wick and examined every part carefully, I was wishing for some living thing in the room with me, just anything so long as it was alive. I think I would have looked with friendliness upon a spider or a fly if one had presented itself, but in those well-screened rooms such things rarely ventured. I sorely regretted leaving my little white, toy dog, Coots to remain overnight at the home of the friend who had cared for him during the day. He was always in the room with me at night, and this night, of all nights, I needed his loving, living companionship and ardently wished that I had driven by for him en route home, it was only a few blocks out of the way. How alone I felt yet was anything but alone. After thoroughly satisfying myself as to the reliability of the little lamp, I placed it very carefully where the light would shed its protection on the bed, lighted it and looked upon it with approbation although it was about as far below par as the other was above. Then I walked over, put out the light and stood in the darkness. This I lost no time in remedying, and stood, puzzled, looking at the little lamp, then went over, took it up and examined it without finding any cause for its delinquency. While I half suspected it was the work of invisible agencies, I was reluctant to accept that which was more disturbing than reassuring and dismissing the suspicion, took the little lamp placed it where I knew it was secure from the faintest breath of draft and lighted it with the very last match in the room. I viewed it more critically this time but nonetheless satisfactorily. I put the light out again and was appalled with the same result. This time I stood in the darkness, so annoyed that I almost forgot to be afraid, staring at the place where I knew the night lamp was, wondering at the repeated extinction of the light. 
Then I knew and a great fear grew and grew upon me until it was something dreadful and I closed my eyes, to shut out the sight of anything that might confront me in the chilly darkness. I felt a presence coming nearer and instinctively lifted my hand to ward it off. A cold grasp met my hand and pressed it firmly downward, until it rested by my side, with all the strength gone out of it, and a voice stern with reproach was saying. Fear is unworthy of you. Did you put that light out? I demanded, ignoring what had been said, as I was in anything but a philosophizing frame of mind. I did. Came the voice evenly. Why? I demanded. Lest you prove yourself unworthy. There was something painful about this rebuke, bringing a sense of unworthiness, and despite the trembling of my limbs I went swiftly across the room, jumped into bed, pulled the light covers up over my head. As I had so often done as a frightened child, shut my eyes and listened, with heart beating wildly. I knew the presence who had chided me stood beside the bed, but I could not, it seemed, remove the cover from my face nor open my eyes, while feeling it was, required of me. The very concentrated essence of fear was upon me, never had I been so demoralized by any sensation, when a voice commanded. Uncover your head. For an instant I felt that it might just as well have said, cut off your head, for one seemed about as easy to do as the other. But after a brief hesitation, during which something seemed to touch my fear with neutralization, I obeyed calmly, opening my eyes at the same time and looking in the direction from whence came the voice. Are you afraid? Came the voice so laden with reproach that I almost shrank before it. I was, but I am not now, I made answer truthfully, as fear had passed away so completely that I could scarcely realize that I had just emerged from the agony of it and was alone in the darkness with a ghost, who conversed with as much unconcern as though the sun was beating down in the noontide of day. This change of mental attitude was so pronounced that my thoughts kept reverting to it, so much so, that finally I asked. Why was I so dreadfully frightened? That you may become superior to fear, to experience fear in its extremity is to recognize the fullness of its impotency. Am I superior to fear now? I asked eagerly. That remains to be seen. Then as if to prove one assertion and test the other the room began filling with misty clouds, white and undulating in movement, in which I caught glimpses of faces and forms, vibrating, ever moving. Blazing eyes shone fleetingly from behind the clouds, vapory hands reached toward me in entreaty and voices came pleadingly, while I watched them eagerly, unafraid. I could feel their touches, feel the bed tremble and shake under their manifestations, but was no longer afraid, quite the contrary. The weird, wondrous beauty, the mystery of it, appealed to me and as I lay watching the misty whiteness and shadowy forms within, listening to the voices, with cool, soft breezes playing about me, there came such a sense of joyous uplifting that the whole earth seemed made anew in this conscious harmony with the invisible. It lies around us like a cloud. The world we cannot see. Yet the sweet closing of an eye may bring us there to be. Its gentle breezes fan our cheeks amid our earthly cares. Its gentle voices whisper love and mingle with our prayers. One, two, I counted. The clock had struck two, calling me back to the reality of passing time. The voice beside me, after expressing pleasure that I had accepted the coming of the unseen in the spirit of its meaning, said with finality, you may sleep now, good night. What has this entity of mystery to do with my sleeping? I was asking myself, as I watched the white mist disperse, the shadowy forms and fancies vanish, felt the vibration cease and listened to the soft retreating footfalls on the stairs and galleries, which sounded unbelievably real. Yet, even then, I realized that it was given only to add a touch of reality to the unreal, that the finite mind might better grasp it. Whether we realize it or not, there is nothing so convincing to the mind as sound. Then as if going out with the rest of it, I drifted into a dreamless sleep that held me until the morning sun was shining. When I awoke, I sat up in bed and looked about guiltily, half expecting to find them still there. Then I sat on the bedside, while memory, that most reliable attribute of mentality, insisted on demonstrating its power of retention, by rehearsing the mystery-laden incidents of the day and night. Incidents that had caused the pendulum to alternate between fear and confidence, defiance and acceptance, until they subsided in joyous surrender. Now as I viewed it in the broad light of day, it seemed a wild, mad, dream, so much so that it frightened, alarmed me and I arose hurriedly and began dressing for the street, 
determined to tear out of my consciousness what the daydream of yesterday and the nightmare of last night had fastened upon it. As I dressed with this determination prodding me I was startled by the voice that I was trying so hard to forget that I had ever heard. Why fight against what you know exists? Please hush, do not begin the day with the mystery of your voice. Whatever you are, be merciful, give me a chance to adjust myself to that which I would fain reject, despite its clamoring for recognition. As you will. Assented the voice calmly, while emotions and conjectures ran riot within and I was further away from a solution than ever, as I would not accept what deep down in my inner consciousness, I knew it was. With this raging conflict in my soul, I went out and while the tension was somewhat lessened by a brisk walk, there was ever the consciousness that I was not alone. All during the day when I came in contact with those who knew me, I was conscious of an effort to regulate my actions in accordance with what would be recognized as natural, to be outwardly calm and well-poised regardless of the storm within. When the voice came, as it did at intervals, during the day, it was gently repulsed with a tentative promise of later recognition. The presence never left me, I could feel the pressure of its force upon me while I resisted it, while I denied its existence and was fighting against unconditional surrender. At the same time I realized that a priceless jewel was being offered me, I wanted to take it, to hold it, to press it to my heart, yet was afraid to touch it, afraid to have it touch me, a fear that was not physical but was a feeling as inexplicable as the cause of it. To accept would be to form all my conceptions and conclusions of life over again. Being a recognized free thinker, to admit a change of sentiment would be a compromise of pride. And thus, all day long I fought the bitter fight with an undercurrent of defeat uppermost in my consciousness. Chapter 4, Shadows of Night When night came again, and I was locked within my apartments, my little dog was with me playing about, while I changed my street clothes for more comfortable house apparel. When I sat down to read the evening paper he lay on a sofa pillow at my feet, evidently free from any disturbing influence. In a few minutes he jumped hurriedly into my lap, barking furiously at some invisible object. I tried to comfort him, but to no avail. Suddenly the barking ceased, the tenseness went out of his body, and he trembled violently, dumb with fear. Thoroughly alarmed I arose with him, walked about, talking to him, but in his endeavor to keep the object of his perturbation under observation, he came so near falling out of my arms that I placed him on the bed and sat down beside him. Instantly he jumped wildly off and ran under it crouching as far back as possible, with trembling in his body and fear in his eyes. I made every effort to coax him out, but he only wagged his tail feebly and looked miserable, refusing to move. Wondering what had so frightened him I looked searchingly about the room but there was nothing unusual in its appearance, not even a suggestion of the supernatural other than a coldness out of harmony with the temperature of the day. Again, I tried to coax him out, but when he persistently refused, his attitude of dejection so appealed to me that I crawled under and brought him out against his inclination. After a little while his fears subsided and I put him on the bed, covering him up completely. A slight trembling of the body was the only remaining evidence of his perturbation. Realizing that sleep was impossible, I pulled an easy chair before a south window and sat where the cool, salt-laden, gulf breeze could blow away some of the cobwebs the spiders of mystery had been weaving in my brain and were lost in thought. I looked out on the beauty of a summer's night with its soft undulating shadows without seeing it, listened to the calling of the sea without hearing it, was fanned by the cool breeze without feeling it, and meshed in a tangled web of mystery that defied unraveling. Then began a solemn marching, first in disorder then single file, of all the stories I had ever read or heard pertaining to ghosts, apparitions, spirits, and all things supernatural, brushing the dust of time from these unfrequented paths of memory. I viewed each eagerly, analytically, as it passed on leaving a sense of insufficiency in its wake, shedding no light on the present, which half irritated me, causing me to swing with the pendulum to the other extreme, and try with all the intensity of which I was capable to convince myself the whole thing was a fabric of fancy, that science could never justify such foolishness. A voice startled me. Why do you persist in trying to deceive yourself? I am trying not to deceive myself, hush please, let me think it out alone. As you will. I knew the room was now peopled with entities of other worlds, but resolutely turned my face away and sent my mind backward into the blank pages of past experiences, and could have laughed at the comedy of it if it had not been so enormously outweighed by my intensity of purpose. There I was, perplexed beyond endurance, 
trying desperately to summon evidence from the pages of the past when all around and about me, waiting upon my acceptance or rejection, was evidence enough to convince the whole world. I was however like the rest of the world, did not care to be convinced. This time I went far back, even violating childhood by digging up the hant stories of my old black nurse, black mammy, with which she had induced sleep when my childish perseverity ignored her crooning lullabies. She had an array of cellar, attic, old house ahants, but her favorite and most effective one, in so far as I was concerned, was that of a headless a negro who had hand a decorder, after the war, in which he had lost his head, and, according to her version, was always looking for a head to appropriate, caring little whether it was white or colored. Here is where my childish interest began and ended. No matter how strong my inclination had been to get up and play, after her assurance that if I did not go to sleep my head would be appropriated by the hand, I would creep further and further down between the white sheets, scarcely daring to breathe. Thus, cold and trembling I would pass into dreamland, where sometimes I met the horrible hand face to face, while she rejoiced in her ability to put, dat sweet chayol, to sleep without scolding her. I smiled bitterly and thought with a shudder of the countless millions, who are sacrificed on the altar of mistaken kindness. Then memory fastened upon a little schoolmate who was unsophisticated enough to admit in broad daylight on the playgrounds of the school, that she not only saw spirits, but talked with them, that they told her many things, some of which she retailed to us, bearing the whole story of her little psychic soul to a jesting, frivolous bevy of schoolgirls, who heaped ridicule upon her sensitive, innocent head even while she was telling the story. There was a sting in the memory that I was not the least among them. Because of this confidence she was completely ostracized by the girls, and even now memory brings back her little tear-stained face, and pleading eyes as she looked at the girls who would not play with her. I was sorry for her, but not sorry enough to act toward her as I now would have others act toward me. Later this sensitive little flower was transplanted to another garden far from the ridicule that had made her life unbearable, all for daring to tell what I now know was the truth. I dwelt painfully upon this incident for some time, even after all these years, chiding myself for the part I'd played in it. Then shaking it off with an effort I passed on over a psychologically barren period from childhood to young womanhood, where an incident, with practically nothing in common with the present, clamored for recognition, and as it belongs to the family of things not measurable by the scientific yardstick, I may as well record it, although the voice I heard was of the living instead of the so-called dead. I was away from home, at a hotel, and in the early morning, between four and five o'clock, I was awakened by a pulling at my pillow and at the same time heard distinctly the voice of my sister saying, Fanny, Eddie Lou is dead, come to me. I sat up in bed, looking quickly around, half expecting to see my sister, for surely it was her voice I had heard. There being nothing tangible I tried to believe I had dreamed it, but I knew I had not and arose with the conviction that my sister's baby was dead without understanding how the intelligence had been conveyed to me. When I turned on the light, I was distressed to find the train was due in a few minutes, rendering it impossible for me to dress and reach the depot in time, which I would have done had time permitted. A few minutes later a message came confirming the child's death and asking me to come, but the train had already gone. As this incident persisted and refused to be waved aside as a thing out of keeping with the present manifestations, I wondered if, after all, it was not a matter of soul speaking to soul, differing from the present only in the soul's being disembodied. It is reasonable to suppose, I contended, that a soul is the same entity within or out of the body. Why not? I was embodied and in communication with the disembodied, manifesting the same principle under different environments. As I was casting about for some other incident to fasten upon, a voice interrupted. The past has nothing to give except the present. Wait until I finish the review, I must satisfy myself, I contended. If you must. Came half ironically. I went back and took up the thread, coming on down the uneventful line to the time when I strayed into the pastures of materialism, which gave to me the joyous freedom of believing nothing, during which time there came stories of the occult and spiritual only to excite my ridicule. So powerful is the influence of non-belief that even as I passed over this period in memory, in my heart I reviled and ridiculed the evidence that surrounded me. All unconsciously I had gone around the circle and had come back to the present and was fighting it, when a voice startled me. And so the review brings you back to the present? Yes, I reluctantly admitted, and looking up in the direction from whence came the voice, my eyes met dark, luminous eyes that looked piercingly into mine, and then vanished. 
Who are you? I demanded. Mian. Came the direct, unexpected answer. Mian, Mian, I repeated musingly. There was something so familiar about the name that I added, more to myself than to the presence, where have I heard that name before? You have heard it many times. Came the response. When and where? At different times and under different circumstances since time began. Since time began? I echoed in interrogatory amazement. Yes, and you have existed since time began but that matters little at present. What does matter at present? Your cooperation. That would be an easy matter if you would only explain the mystery of your coming, where you came from, why you came and all about it. Tell me plainly what is required of me. Has life, in any of its phases, ever been explained to you other than by living it? No, I grudgingly admitted. This phase, being a part of life, is no exception. In what way is it a part of life? It is not a part of everybody's life. Yes, it is the subconscious part, the soul life. The life of the spirit is continuous and everlasting. Rather an unrecognized part in the average life, is it not? No. There are indeed few who deny the existence of the soul, the indefinable something over which the physical has no control. However, I would appreciate some explanation, as all this is very disturbing and mysterious to me. You would not believe. Suppose I told you my coming was in response to your oft-repeated challenge. How vividly my words came back to me. I demand some material, tangible evidence, until then I shall believe nothing. It was thus in a tone of finality, I always disposed of religious arguments that intruded upon my materialistic views, never dreaming that that which I demanded would be given, in fact, quite the reverse, I was sure it would not. And now being actually confronted with the very thing that I had demanded I was loath to accept it, but there was nothing else to do. I had weighed my little store of knowledge or rather store of little knowledge in the balance and found it wanting. With this realization full upon me I arose, slowly turned about and faced the forces that were confronting me, leaving the willow the wisps of the past to the oblivion to which the present consigned them. There was no demonstration, they were waiting with the patience born only of assurance, over all was an unearthly stillness and a cold creepiness that made me shrink a little as I stood hesitating, waiting for I knew not what. A cold hand took mine with a gentle pressure that seemed to impel me forward, as a voice was saying. Come, bathe in the light of the victory that is yours. As I wondered at a sentence so strange, many voices took up the call, come, come, until the echo floated back from afar to the accompaniment of the softest music and something within me was making response. I am here, I have come, as I walked as one in a dream and sat upon the bedside in the apathy of resignation, which gradually mingled into a joyousness that comes not of earth. After retiring I neither invited nor resisted demonstrations from that which I knew to be surrounding me but lay listlessly observing little lights, all sizes, ranging from pinhead size to a few much larger, that were fluctuating and vibrating, all scintillating as they rolled about within the white mist where flashes of miniature lightning were coming and going intermittently. There was something so restfully fascinating about it that sleep threatened to come in and shut it out, when suddenly, standing beside the bed was a tall, dark person, illuminated from head to feet by a scintillating light which came from within and lighted up the body like an electric light does the globe, which encloses it. This time the luminous eyes blazed into mine unflinchingly, as in awe I whispered. Mian? Yes, Mian. Came the confirmation, as I watched it slowly vanish, noting with wonder that the light within which had illuminated the body, was the last thing to disappear. Before it disappeared, it stood in the same spot blazing and scintillating like a live thing as I stared at it until it became one with the misty whiteness, and still I could feel the presence beside me. And thus, with sleep murdered within me, all night long I drank deeply of this cup of mystery without knowing or caring whether it was the wine of life or its poisoned lees, held by its intoxication until the grey dawn gave way to the pink sunrise.